So peace be with you guys, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is our third time that we've done this seminar. Um, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see a bunch of you return, and um, I apologise that I changed the, uh, the, 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 the link at the last minute. But do please um, keep people coming in who want to come in. Um, today's session at the request of y, Brother YP, is we're going to be looking at a number of different problems inside the Quran. That is where our focus is going to be. And it, so so we're going for breadth over depth. Um, I'm going to try and make the whole presentation within about an hour and 15 minutes, and then that will give us time for questions afterwards uh, and discussion for those that want it. And once that dries up, um, that will sort of bring it to an end the whole session will last about two hours max um so as you've got questions as we go on please do write down your questions and then what we'll do is i'll, I'll try to give time for questions afterwards and that way it allows me to get through all the information um we're going to go through about 12 points um these points and essentially, the argument is going to be constructed from using the Quran, backed up by tafsir, which I'm sure you all know is Islamic interpretations of the Quran or Islamic commentary on the Quran. And the, the tafsir will demonstrate that my interpretation of the Quranic verse is accurate. And if my interpretation of the Quranic verse is accurate, then that means that my criticism of the Quran is accurate as well. And that's why we're going to use tasfiyah. There'll be one or two places where we use a hadith, but not many. And um, there'll be one or two places where I appeal to other sources to demonstrate the point that I'm making. Um, so there you go. And that's how it's going to go. Are we all clear about the way forward, YP? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, no worries. Brilliant. So... Yes, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask someone to pray for us. Lynn, you're having connection problems. You're you're coming through a bit like a Dalek from the BBC series Doctor Who. Um so YP, you're clearer. So I'm gonna ask you to pray. Please pray in Indonesian, because unlike in Islam, we celebrate all cultures, all languages, and all ethnicities. And Indonesian is as good as English. So please do pray for us um in Indonesian and um, we'll get started from there. Oke, okay, let's pray. Uh, Tuhan, terima kasih kalau malam ini kami boleh berkumpul di Zoom untuk belajar. Tuhan, uh, pimpin Bob the Builder yang akan membawakan materi. Tuhan sertai teman-teman uh, yang bergabung dan kami menunggu banyak teman yang akan join bersama kami. Terima kasih untuk kesempatan uh, pelajaran yang berharga di Zoom ini. Dalam nama Tuhan Yesus, Tuhan dan Juru Selamat kami, kami bersyukur dan berdoa. Amin. Amin. Thanks be to God. Right, guys. So uh, I've explained what we're going to do. So now we're going to get straight into it. So the first problem that I'm sure you guys are familiar with, and you've probably noticed this yourself, is um, on the Trinity. And I'm not going to go through every verse that we could quote on the Quran. Um because as I say, we're going for breadth, not depth on this occasion. Um, but we, we're going to look at two surahs of the Quran, uh, and we're going to see the problem in that. So in surah 4, and, and YP, you're going to be the person that I talk to in the whole of this seminar. I'll ask questions to you. Um, and, and that's just so that, you know, I've got a feel for how uh, I'm communicating and making sure that you're following the argument. Um, and then if there's any questions, please type them in the chat or message YP so that when I talk to him, if he needs to clarify something or ask a question to me in the midst of it, we can do that um, for clarification purposes. But if you can reserve your question until the end, that'll help. So in Surah 4, 171, it says this. Obviously, it's an English translation that I'm about to use. It says, O people of the scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion and do not say about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, 
son of Mary, is indeed nothing but Allah's messenger and his word that he cast to Mary and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say three. Refrain. It is better for you. Indeed, Allah is only one God. Highly exalted is he that he should have a son. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. And Allah suffices as a trustee. And in Surah 5, 116, it says, And recall when Allah said, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to mankind, Take me and my mother as two gods apart from Allah? He said, highly exalted are you. It is not for me to say what I have no right to. Had I said it, you would have known it. You know whatever is within my inner self, and I do not know whatever is within yourself. You are indeed the superb knower of the hidden realms. Okay, guys, so my, my question to you is, um, your YP, um, what was the obvious error that you heard in that Quranic description? Quran 4171. Yeah, what 4171. What was the error? Did you hear it? It's okay if you didn't, don't worry. And um, um, and 5116. Did you hear the error? Hang on, let me check. If you didn't hear the error, that's all right. So the, Allah the, cannot have a child. Allah cannot have a child. So the the let me ask you this question, Lynn, or YP, whichever wants to answer first. How many gods do we believe in? One, One God. One God. Exactly. But listen to this phrase in the Quran. It says, um, and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say three. Refrain, it is better for you. Indeed, Allah is only one God. So this phrase where it says Allah is only one God and do not say three means that the one God is qualifying the word three, implying that Christians believe in three gods. Now, that's clearly wrong. We don't believe in three gods. If you read the Bible, it's very clear the Bible teaches that there is only one God. I'm not going to quote the Bible verses to you because I'm sure you know them. Um, if anyone's really stuck, I can show you some, but I'm quite sure that you, you can find them on your own. You're all adults. The, 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 the Bible is very clear there's only one God. The Quran is accusing us of believing in three gods. It also says in 5116, it says, and highly exalt, um, and did you, uh, and Allah said, oh, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to mankind, take me and my mother as two gods? Well, we don't believe in two gods about, apart from the one God. So this statement is a falsity. Now, Muslims might try to say, oh, it's not talking about the Trinity, but that isn't how Ibn Kathir saw it. So I'm going to read a tasfir by Ibn Kathir. Lin or YP, do you know who Ibn Kathir is? Yes, he's from Baghdad. Yeah. yeah. And he's one of the he's one of the chief commentators on the Quran. Muslims love Ibn Kathir. He's one of the people that they recognize as a scholar of the Quran. They like his um his commentary on the Quran, and this is what he says. So his commentary says this. Allah forbids the people of the scripture from going to extremes in religion, which is a common trait of theirs, especially amongst the Christians. The Christians exaggerate over Isa until they elevated him above the grade that Allah had gave him. They elevated him from the rank of prophethood to being a God whom they worshipped just as they worshipped Allah. So clearly Ibn Kathir thinks that this passage is talking about Christians and that Christians believe in multiple gods. It goes on, they exaggerated even more in the case of those who they claim were his followers, claiming that they were inspired, thus following every word they uttered, whether true or false, be it guidance or misguidance, truth or lies, nor say of Allah except the truth, means do not lie and claim that Allah has a wife, or a son, 
Allah is far holier than what they attribute to him. Now, let me ask you this, Lynn or YP. Do we claim that Allah has a son because he has a wife? No. No. So we don't Ibn claim Al that Allah has. Uh, we don't claim that our God has has uh, our Jehovah has a wife. Exactly. So so clearly the Quran is making a statement. Ibn Kathir is making a statement about what we believe based upon what the Quran teaches. And it is saying that Christians believe that God has a son because he has a wife and that, that we believe as Christians in more than one God. And Ibn Kathir is getting this information from the Quran. That's where he's getting it from. OK, uh, whether you worship Lord, but him, I'll, I'll, call, I'll go back to what Ibn Kathir is saying to him. For Allah is far above, for Allah is far above. Uh, where well, Sorry, where were we? Exaggerated means do not lie. Where were we? Bear with us. Allah glorified, there we go. Allah glorified and praised and honored in his might, grandeur and greatness. There is no deity worthy of worship, Lord, but him. So again, clearly Ibn Kathir thinks we believe in more than one God. Allah said, al Masih Isa, son of Maryam, was no more than a messenger. Just letting in a brother, bear with us. He wants to get in. Um, no more than a messenger of Allah and his word, which he bestowed on Maryam and a spirit created by him. Isa is only one of Allah's servants and one of his creatures. Okay. Allah said to him, be... And he was, and he sent him as a messenger. Isa was a word from Allah that he bestowed on Maryam, meaning he created him with the word B, and he sent with Ib Jibril to Maryam. Jibril blew the life of Isa into Maryam by Allah's leave, and Isa came into existence as a result. This incident was in place of the normal conception between man and woman that results in children. This is why Isa was a word, a ruch, a spirit, created by Allah, as he said, no father to, as he had no father to conceive him. Right. So that's that's how they're thinking. When we talk about Jesus being the Son of God. Muslims think because of Ibn Kathir and others like Ibn Kathir that that's what we mean when we say Jesus is the son of God, which clearly is not what we believe. We believe that the father eternally generated the son from eternity to eternity without beginning or end. There was no wife. No, no, there was no beginning to this. It just always was, always is, and always will be. So Ibn Kathir has misinformed Muslims, and Muslims repeat this to us, thinking that they're trying to educate us, when actually they're speaking from ignorance. Rather, he, the, Ibn Kathir goes on, rather he became he came into existence through the word that Allah uttered be, and he was, through the life that Allah sent with Jibril. Allah said, al masi Isa, son of Maryam, was no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. His mother, Maryam, was Siddika, and they both ate food. And Allah said, so believe in Allah and his messenger. Believe that Allah is one and alone. So Ibn Kathir thinks that when the Quran says three, referring to the Trinity, referring to what Christians believe, that we believe there's more than one God, and that is not what we believe, and that he is above, the, and that he, sorry, and that he does not have a son or a wife, no, and be certain that Isa is the, certain, the, the servant and messenger of Allah. Allah said that after that, say not three. Do not elevate Isa and his mother to be gods with Allah. Now notice, Ibn Kathir, has linked the idea of the three with the idea that the three is made up of Allah, Isa, and Mary. It's so when we point out to Muslims that this is an error, and they and we say to them, look, we don't believe that that Mary and Isa and Allah are part of the Trinity. And they go, no, 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 no. These are two different verses and they refer to two different things. Well, that is not how Ibn Kathir thought about it. Ibn Kathir 
a famous Muslim commentator, linked the three of Surah 4171 to the Isa and Maryam of 5116. He links them together as if one verse commentates on the other verse. And that means that when we say to Muslims, look, your Allah gets the Quran, uh, gets the Trinity wrong. And they try to say to us, no, 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 it's it, it's talking about two different things. Well, Ibn Kathir interprets this, it, interprets it in the same way that we interpret it. Ibn Kathir continues, say not three, do not elevate Isa and his mother to be gods with Allah. Allah is far holier than what they attribute to him. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, Allah said, Surely the disbelievers are those who said Allah is the third of three. So here, all the verses that we use to talk about the Trinity, and we say to Muslims, look, this is how the Quran describes the Trinity. And Muslims try to, and, and we say that the Quran gets it wrong. And then Muslims say to us, no, 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 you're, you're, you're mixing up verses. You're, you're putting verses together that don't belong together. It's Ibn Kathir who's putting them together. It's not just us. We're using one of their greatest commentators. And Ibn Kathir is agreeing with Christians like me in my interpretation of what the Quran says about the Trinity. And the Quran gets it wrong. Ibn Kathir continues. But there is none who has what they attribute to him. Now, remember that there is none who has what they attribute to him, because that's going to be relevant later in a different argument. In Surah Al-Ma'adi, chapter 5, Allah said, surely the disbelievers are those. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm reading the same page. Right to be worshipped, but one God. Let me just read that again. Sorry, because I, I, I lost it. These are very long lines of literature. Surah 5, Madi chapter 5, Allah, surely, Allah said, Surely disbelievers are those who said Allah is the third of three, but there is none but who has the right to be worshipped but one God. So notice how Ibn Kathir phrases that. None has the right to be worshipped but one God, implying that Christians believe in more than one God. And Ibn Kathir is getting this information from the Quran. So the Quran is wrong about what we believe because the Trinity is not a belief in more than one God. It is a belief in monotheism. It is a belief in one God. Allah said by the end of the same surah, and remember when Allah will say on the day of resurrection, O Isa, son of Maryam, you say unto men, worship me. And it's beginning. Surely in disbelief are they who say that Allah is the Messiah, son of Maryam. The Christians, so clearly he's linking all this information to Christians. So the Quran is talking about Christians. The Christians, may Allah curse them, have no limit to their disbelief because of their ignorance. But it's actually the Quran that's ignorant because we don't believe what the Quran is describing. So their deviant statements and their misguidance grows. Some of them believe that Isa is Allah. Some believe that he is one in a trinity. And some believe that he is the son of Allah. Now, this particular phrase of Ibn Kathir is true in the sense of lots of Christians don't understand what the doctrine of the Trinity is. And they phrase it badly. They can't explain it properly. But Muslims also are the ones that don't want to hear. Because when we do explain what we believe, lots of Muslims just reassert what the Quran says. And we need to be firm in our belief as Christians that there is only one God, that there aren't any other gods, and that God is one within himself. That's the, that's the foundation of the Trinity, that there is only one God, there aren't any other gods, and that God is one within himself, that the Father is that God, that the Son is that God, and that the Holy Spirit is that God. And we see the evidence for that across the entirety of the Bible. But as we said, we're looking at polemics against the Quran today. So we're not I'm not going to teach you stuff. You can go away and research this for yourself. And those are the basic statements that you can research and it'll help you to identify scripture that demonstrates that. Because our vision of the Trinity is to use the entirety of the Bible together 
to come up with what portrait it gives us about God. And that's what we believe. Um, uh, bear with us. Ibn Kathir goes on, their beliefs and creeds are numerous and contradict each other, prompting some people to say that if 10 Christians meet, they would end up with 11 sects. So Ibn Kathir has demonstrated irony because the Quran that Ibn Kathir is using to describe Christian beliefs gets the Trinity wrong. The Trinity is not a belief in three gods. It does not include Mary. Christians believe in one God, and we believe that the Father has a son, but not because he has a wife, and that the Father has a son because from eternity past to eternity present to eternity future, the son always flows out of the Father, is begotten of the Father. Okay, YP and Lynn, did that make sense? Yep. Uh, brother, could you share the material because some uh, participant asked me about the, to share the link maybe the, the, the screens yeah. share the screen you share screen? Share the link? no you need you need you need a pen and paper guys you need pen and paper that's all you need just pen and paper write down the notes this is like a lecture at university it's like a lecture at college you write down your notes um i'll, I'll share the screen when i need to um, but then you guys are going to have access to the re this recording, okay. so you'll be able to go over the recording again and and, and look at these um, notes yourself. Yeah, um, and the the commentaries. What I'll do is at the end I'll I'll share the link where I've got the commentaries from um, as well. All right. Okay. So, is there any questions on that? Very quick questions of clarification before I move on to the next one. Well, I see that the Muslims or Ibn Kathir got uh, the, the understanding of the Trinity <clears throat> wrong or a misunderstanding of the Trinity just because they don't know, or they don't understand what the Trinity means. Yeah, they, they, get, they don't, they don't understand the Trinity yeah. and they don't understand the Trinity because the Quran gets it wrong. And because the Quran gets it wrong and they have to believe that the Quran is true, they actually think that we can't explain our own faith. And actually, we can explain our faith, those of us that are knowledgeable and have studied. And the Quran is the one that is getting it wrong, not Christians, not the Bible. Okay, guys, any other questions of clarification before we move on? Because I want to leave time at the end for questions and discussion, but I want to make sure I get through the presentation first. So these are just clarification questions before I move on. Yeah. Go on. Wonder. Go on. Moving on. All right. So the next one. There's a there's an obvious contradiction in Quranic teaching or uh, that's connected to this idea of, you know, when Muslims say to us, how can one person bear the punishment of another? This is unjust. Has anyone heard that? Uh, have YP Lin, have, has any Muslim ever said that to you? How can how can Jesus bear our sins? Yeah. He's just one man. Has anyone said that? Have you experienced that? Yeah, I've heard it. Yeah, you've experienced that. Okay, so now I, I want to show you that the Islamic literature has that same idea in their religion. So, if you look at Surah thirty-five, eighteen, it states this: "And no bearer of burdens bears the burden of another." So that's why Muslims say to us, "Hey, how can Jesus?" bear our sins that doesn't make any sense that's unfair and that the reason why they say that is because of surah 35 18 and no bearer of burden bears the burden of another and even if a heavily laden one calls for help with its load nothing of it will be carried even if the one called be a relative you are only to warn those who fear their lord though unseen and have established the prayer and whoever purifies himself only purifies himself to his own benefit and to Allah is the destiny so that's where Muslims get this idea from that that no bear no one can bear someone else's sins and that's why they say to Christians hey how can Jesus our Lord bear the sins of humanity uh, that doesn't make any sense it's wrong okay but then 
In Surah 29.13, listen to what it says. Yet they will surely carry their own heavy burdens and other heavy burdens with their own heavy burdens. And they will surely be asked on the day of resurrection about what they used to fabricate. So one surah of the Quran is saying that no one bears another person's burdens. And a different surah of the Quran, is a different ayah of the Quran, is saying that they do bear one another's burdens. So do they or don't they? Is it that no bearer of burdens bears the burden of another? Or is it yet they will surely carry their own heavy burdens and other heavy burdens with their own heavy burdens? Which part of the Quran is telling us the truth? Which part of the Quran should we believe? Our friend Ibn Kathir says this. The arrogant claim of the disbelievers that they would carry the sins of others if they would return to disbelief. That's the title heading. And this is what he says in the commentary on the surah we've just read. Allah tells us that the disbelievers of the Quraysh said to those who believed and followed the truth, leave your religion, come back to our religion and follow our way. Let us bear your sins. So in other words, they're saying, come back to paganism. And if you do, then your sins are on us because we're the ones that have convinced you. Meaning, if there is any sin on you, we will bear it and it will be our responsibility. It is like a person saying, do this and your sin will be on my shoulders. Allah says, proving this to be a lie, never will they bear anything of their sins. Surely they are liars. In their claim that they will bear the sins of others, for no person will bear the sins of another. Now, that lines up with what Muslims say about Jesus Christ not bearing our sins, because he's saying no one's going to do that. Allah says, and if one heavily laden calls uh, another to bear his load, nothing of it will be lifted, even though he be near uh, next of kin. And no friend will ask a friend about his condition, although they shall be made to see one another. That's Surah 70, Ayah 10 to 11 that Ibn Kathir just quoted. And verily, they shall bear their own loads and other loads besides their own. Here Allah tells us that those who call others to disbelief and misguidance will, on the day of resurrection, bear their own sins and the sins of others because of their people, that, because of the people they misguided. Yet that will not detract from the burden of those other people in the slightest, as Allah says. So in other words, Ibn Kathir acknowledges the contradiction. He says, on one hand, that when the pagans said to the Muslims, come back to paganism, we will bear responsibility for your sin. Allah says that is wrong. And then in the next breath, Allah says, yes, they will indeed bear a burden for what they have misguided people. So in other words, they will also bear that sin. But the, the sort of cop out that they get is this idea that it won't detract from the burden of those other people in the slightest. In other words, the people that have committed the sin will bear their own sin still and a double debt will be put onto the people that mislead them. However, however, in the Hadiths, we read this. Ibn Abi Hatim recorded that Abu Umma, Umama, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the messenger of Allah conveyed the message with which he was sent. Then he said, beware of injustice, for Allah will swear an oath on the day of resurrection and will say, by my glory and majesty, no injustice will be overlooked today. And then a voice will call out, where is so-and-so? the son of so-and-so, and he will be brought forth, followed by his good deeds, which appear like mountains, while the people are gazing at them in wonder, until he is standing before the most merciful. So basically, on the day of judgment, the, the hadith is saying that people will come forward on the day of judgment, and all their good deeds will come like a mountain behind them or in front of them, I'm not sure. And then the caller will be commanded to say, 
whoever is owed anything by so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, or has been wronged by him, let him come forth. So that it's like, if, if, if this guy's done anything wrong to you, he owes you something, come forward now, is what Allah is saying. Whoever is owed anything by so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, or has been wronged by him, let him come forth. So they will come forth and gather before the most merciful. Then the most merciful will say, settle the matter for my servant. They will say, how can we settle the matter? He will say, take from his good deeds and give it to them. They will keep taking from his good deeds until there is nothing left. And there will still be people with scores to settle. Allah will say, settle the matter for my servant. They will say, he does not have even one good deed left. Allah will say, take from their evil deeds and give them to him. So did you hear that? Allah says, he does not even have one good deed left. Allah says, take from their evil deeds and give them to him. So Allah is taking the sins of the people and putting it on the debtor on the day of judgment. Then the prophet quoted this ayah. And verily they shall bear their own loads and other loads beside their own. And verily they shall be questioned on the day of resurrection about that which we, they used to fabricate. There is a corroborating report in the Sahih with a different chain of narration. In another hadith, it says no Muslim would die, but Allah would admit in his stead a Jew or a Christian in hellfire. So here's a hadith that says that in, when, when a Muslim is due to go to hell, Allah will put a Jew or a Christian in hell for them. And that's from uh, Umar B. Abd al-Aziz took an oath by one besides whom there is no god but he thrice that his father had narrated that to him from allah's messenger so you've got two hadiths that demonstrate that people are going to receive the sins and the good deeds of one another it's going to be distributed outwards and that allah will put jews and christians into hell so that muslims don't have to go there now Guys, how can Muslims say to us, how can Jesus take our sins away when Allah is doing that with people's sins and their good works? It's a double standard and we shouldn't let them escape from that. These yeah. are, this, is, this is something in the Quran and in Islamic teaching that they, 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 they make an argument that backfires on them. Now, just very briefly, uh, again, I'm not going to try and teach you Christianity today because this is something that you need to be learning in your churches. You need to be learning it for yourselves. But the reason why Christ's humanity can bear the sins of the world is because the, th that, that humanity is filled with a divine person, the son of the father. And thus the value of that one life is equal to the whole of creation. Because it is filled with a divine person. And that that means that the humanity is equal to the entirety of existence. You know, it wasn't that, that Christ's death just atoned for our sins. It was worthy. It, it, its value was infinitely more than all of our sins combined. And this is the mercy of our God. That from the first drop of blood, all of our sins were wiped away. And that is the mercy of our God. And it is given to us as a gift. You know, and, and Muslims can't complain because, as I've just demonstrated, they have the same belief in their Quran, in their Hadith and in their Tafsir. Any questions, clarification questions before I move on to my next point on that one? I have no question. Yeah. Wipe, I just, wipe. Want, I just want to make a... Uh, statement what uh, in Indonesia like this they deny that Jesus Christ can bury our sins but Allah put the sins of the Muslims at the end of the world to Christian and Jew this Isn't is very hypocrite uh, yeah it's it's an argument that doesn't make sense 
it, it definitely isn't an argument that makes sense at all. Um, let me just come out of something because I managed to click on something I didn't need to click on. There we go. Right, that's much better. Right, guys, I'm going to go on to my next uh, argument. Bear with us unless there's any more questions. If there's none, clarification questions only at this point. If not, I will move on to my next argument. Did you follow that argument, well, Lynn? Uh, Did I'm it make going sense? To put a stupid question. I'm going to put a stupid question. How can the burden of Muslims be put on a Christian and Jew? Can, can I ask Isn't you to ask great? that? Uh, Lynn, I, I, I'll ask you to ask that question at the end. I, I was just looking for clarification okay. questions. <laughs> So ask wrong. that question at the end when we do the discussion. Okay, so yeah. I'll move on to my next point then. Move on, so yes. The next, the, the, the next error in the Quran is if you turn to Surah 3, Ayah 55, we read this. As Allah said, O oh Jesus, I am taking you back and raising you to me and cleansing you of those who denied. So Allah is saying, I'm going to take you up to heaven. And anyone who denied you, you're free of them. OK, and I am making those who follow you superior to those who denied until the day of resurrection. Now, that's the key phrase. And I am making those who follow you superior to those who denied until the day of resurrection. The Quran here is describing what we call an alternate history a different history, a history that isn't known in the history books, a history that comes from somewhere else. OK, um, this this um, this this history is testable. We can look into it to see if it's accurate, because the Quran is saying that first century Muslims who followed Isa, the Muslim prophet, are going to be victorious over those that did not believe in the Muslim prophet Isa. And they're going to be superior. They're going to win. And then it goes, the Quran goes on to say, and then to me is your return. Then I will judge between you regarding whatever you used to differ over. Now, let's just read from some Tasfir because I want to demonstrate to you that the Tasfir agree with what I am saying. So in Abbas Tanwir al Mikbas min Tasfir ibn Abbas, it says, and remember when Allah said, O oh Jesus, lo, I am gathering thee and causing thee to ascend unto me, and I am cleansing, saving thee of those who disbelieve in you, and I am setting those who follow you your religion above those who disbelieve with strong argument and triumph until the day of resurrection. Then I shall make you to die after descent. It is also said, this means I shall make your heart die to, to the love of the life of this world. Uh, and then they will return after death and I shall judge between you as to that wherein it, uh, in religion you used to differ to argue now th that's his so he clearly that's abbas's tanwir al mikbas min tasfir and abbas clearly states that uh, those who follow your religion i.e islam of the first century muslims above those who disbelieve so that's in other words Pauline Christianity or the Christianity that we all follow with strong argument and triumph. Now, Jalal, I'll, I'll just let in a brother bear with us who wants to come in. Now, Jalal Al Jalalain says, and mention when God said, Oh Jesus, I am gathering you, seizing you, and raising you to me away from the world without death. And I am cleansing you of removing you far away from those who disbelieved. And I am settling those who follow you, those Christians and Muslims who believed in your prophethood, above those who disbelieved in you, namely the Jews, becoming above them through definitive argument and the sword until the day of resurrection. 
So it's say so Jalal al Jalalain thinks that Christians will dominate the Jews by the sword until the day of resurrection because they believe that Jesus is a prophet. Um let me just go on. I I, I think I've I think I've got another hadith here, but I'm another tasfir here. Yeah, this is from Ibn Kathir. So Ibn Kathir says this. Yeah. Um bear with us. Yeah, I've got another I think I, all right. So I'm going to yeah, I think this is for I've so basically I I forgot to put which commentator this is. I think it's Ibn Kathir. Um, but I'm going to share with you the link so you'll be able to match up my words um, with which commentator it was that said these words. But I think from memory, it's Ibn Kathir. It says, this is what happened when Allah raised Isa to heaven. His followers divided into sex and groups. Some of them believed in what Allah sent Isa as a servant of Allah, his messenger and the son of his female servant. Yeah, this is Ibn Kathir. However, some of them went on to the extreme over Isa, believing that he was the son of Allah. Some of them said that Isa was Allah himself, while others said that he was one of a trinity. Allah mentioned these false creeds in the Quran and refuted them. The Christians... Now, let me just point something out here. No Christian says that Isa was Allah in the sense that if Allah is equal to the Father... No Christian says that the son is equal to the father. So actually, Ibn Kathir has just pointed out that the Quran has another error because no Christian believes that. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the father, you're not a Christian. That is not what Christians believe. Christians don't say that Jesus is the father. That's patriopassionism. It's a heresy. So the Quran has there got another error into it. But Ibn Kathir continues. He says, the Christians remained like this until the third century. Sorry, Ibn Kathir goes on. Allah mentioned these false creeds in the Quran and refuted them. The Christians remained like this until the third century when a Greek king called Constantine became a Christian for the purpose of destroying Christianity. Constantine was either a philosopher or he was just a plain ignorant. Constantine changed the religion of Isa by adding to it and deleting from it. He established the rituals of Christianity and the so-called great trust, which is in fact the great treachery. He also allowed them to eat the meat of swine, changed the direction of prayer that Isa established to the east, built churches for Isa, and added 10 days to the fast as compensation for a sin that he committed as claimed. So the religion of Isa became the religion of Constantine, who built bef who built more than 12,000 churches, temples, and monasteries for Christians, as well as the city that bears his name, Constantinople. Throughout this time, the Christians had the upper hand and dominated the Jews. Allah aided them against the Jews because they used to be closer to the truth than the Jews, even though both groups are still were and are still believers. So not only does Ibn Kathir here contradict the Quran, because the Quran says that the followers of Isa, the believers of Isa, the Muslims of Isa will be superior, whereas Ibn Kathir says, well, it's just the Christians, even though they are disbelievers. But literally, guys, as someone who's a historian and someone who's a church historian, let I mean in, in lay terms at least, let, let me be clear. Ibn Kathir is literally making up history. He's literally lying to Muslims here. He is lying to them through his back teeth. But unfortunately, this is a popular myth. There's even Christians that believe this nonsense. Constantine did not invent or change Christianity. He simply made it a legal religion amongst many religions in the Roman Empire. That's all he did. He convened a council in Nicaea that clarified the philosophical discussion around the relationship between the son and the father. And that's it. That's what he did. He didn't change Lent, which is the 40-day fast that he's talking about. Um, 
he reco- he allowed Christians to reclaim churches that had been taken away from them. And yes, he rebranded a city um, called uh, Byzantium that he rebranded as Constantine, uh, Constantinople. But he didn't do the things that um, Ibn Kathir is saying. Ibn Kathir is simply lying. Now, um, it, there's another commentator, and unfortunately, I have definitely forgot to put the names in, so I apologize about that. But when you get the link, you'll be able to just pull it up yourself and you'll see. Um, but I, I think I've established the point that I'm making. And the point is that Muslim commentators interpret this passage, 355, as saying that the Christians are going to be politically, socially, and economically superior to the Jews because they followed Isa. Now, what's the problem there? Does anybody want to take a guess? Lynn or YP? Well, I know this is... Yeah. What, 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 what's the problem with this statement that Muslims from the first century are going to be superior over anyone who disbelieved in Isa? Does anyone know? There is no Muslims in the first century. Well, that's definitely true. There, there's no yeah, record Muslims of any Muslims. Muslims only exist after the uh, after the eight centuries, not even the seven centuries. Yep, there's no there's no record of any Muslims existing in the first century. And more to the point, and this is true for us guys, right? We are all Christians of the apostles. We all follow the teachings of the apostles. Peter, James, John, Paul, and the others. These apostles and their religion is what we follow. That religion is the one that was victorious in the first century. That was the religion that went on to be superior. That's the religion that went on to dominate. That's the religion that conquered the Roman Empire. So th these Muslim um, followers of G a Muslim prophet called Isa... Not only is there no historical record of their ever existing, but also even if they did exist, they lost Paul and his Christianity with the apostles won. And if that if if our Christianity won in the Roman Empire and was superior, then that means Allah failed in his promise. Allah promised something and it did not come to pass. It's not good enough that they won for a day or two. Allah said, until the day of resurrection. So that's all the time. Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir says that Ibn Kathir says that they lost straight away. Abbas Tanwa al Abbas said that they uh, were meant to be victorious. He interprets them as as being victorious, and that simply did not happen. Um, Jalal al Jalalain also said that they were going to be victorious in the world of politics, social, society, and economics. So they're interpreting the Quran in the same way that I'm interpreting the Quran, but it did not happen like that. History did not work out like that. Muslims have the wrong history. And that means that Allah failed in his promises. Now, guys, I'm just going to read a little bit about the history of Constantine, okay? Um, so, uh, bear with us. So I'm going to... I don't want to read too much around... I don't want to read all of it, so let me just find a, a quick part. Um so Constantine is perhaps best known for being the first Roman emperor to endorse Christianity, which is true, traditionally presented as a result of an omen, a Cairo in the sky, which is a Christian symbol, with the inscription in hoc signo vicis or by, thy, by this sign conquer, before the victory at the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 AD, when Constantine is said to have instituted the new standard to be carried into battle called the Lab Labarum. Christian historians ever since Lactantius 
have adhered to the view that Constantine adopted Christianity as a kind of replacement for the official Roman paganism, though the document called the donation of Constantine was proved a forgery. So in other words, Constantine didn't replace paganism with Christianity. That is not what he did. It's a fake document and a God should know that. And um, Muslims, uh, Muslim commentators don't seem to have recognized that. Um, though not until the 15th century when the stories of Constantine's conversion were long established facts. So in other words, they were you Ibn Kathir is using the wrong history. He's and actually his history is even wrong when you compare it to what Lactantius said. It was attributed as documenting the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity for centuries. Even Christian skeptics have accepted this formulation, though seeing Constantine's policy as a political rather than spiritual move. By the end of the third century, Christian communities and the bishops had become a force to contend with. So that's before Constantine. We were already a force to contend with in urban centres, especially. Christians were preferred for high government positions. The church was granted various special privileges and churches like the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem were constructed. Christian bishops took aggressive public stances that were unknown among other cult leaders, even among the Jews. Proselytism had had to be publicly outlawed up to this time, simply to maintain public decorum. In the essential legions, however, Christianity was despised as womanish and the soldiers followed pagan cults of Mithras and Isis. So clearly Christianity was an upcoming and victorious power by the third century, but it wasn't the only group out there. There were other groups contending and fighting with Christianity, none of them Muslim. It was Christianity, Judaism, or some form of paganism. Since the Roman emperors ruled by divine right and stayed in power through support of the legions, it was important for them to be seen to support a strong state religion. The consumerly of the Christians consisted in their public refusal to participate in official rites that no one deeply believed in, but which were an equivalent of an oath of allegiance. Refusal might easily bring upon all the Roman people the loss of the gods' support. Such were the usual justifications for occasional lynchings of Christians by Roman soldiers, the, the fair of many martyriologies. Constantine and Licinius' Edict of Milan in 313 neither made paganism illegal nor made Christianity a state-sponsored religion. What it did was to legalize Christianity, return confiscated church property, and establish Sunday as a day of worship for Christians. Though the church prospered under Constantine's patronage, it also fell into the first of many public schisms, which led to the first ecumenical council, considering the problem of Arianism. So those of some of you need to look into um, a dispute about the personhood and godhood of Jesus Christ. It produced the Nicene Creed, which favoured the position of Athanasius, Arius' opponent, and became an official doctrine. So, Constantine did not invent Christianity. Constantine did not make Christianity a state religion. Ibn Kathir is wrong. The Quran makes a false promise. I think that covers that one. Any clarification questions on that one before we press on? No, go ahead. Okay, so let's move on to number two then. Okay, so um, the who who knows the passage about the setting of the sun? Setting of the sun in a pool of muddy water. It's in 1886, and it says this. Until when he had reached the setting of the sun, he found it setting in a murky spring and found a people in its vicinity. He said, O Zul Karnain, you may either punish or else treat them kindly. Now, interestingly, just as a side note, as I'm sure you guys know, there's different versions of the Quran. Um, but in the Qur'at, um, all except the Qur'at of Nafi, Ibn Kathir, and Abu Amr al-Hafs and Yaqub read as 
in a hot spring. So they don't say they found it setting in a in a murky spring. They say they found it setting in a hot spring. So there is a variation between different Qurans about whether we're talking about a murky spring or a hot spring. Ibn Kathir commentates it on it in this way. He said, when he reached the setting place of the sun means he followed a route until he reached the furthest point that could be reached in the direction of the sun setting, which is the west of the earth. As for the idea of his reaching the place in the sky where the sun sets, this is something impossible. And the tales told by storytellers that he traveled so far so so far to the west that the sun set behind him are not true at all. Most of these stories come from the myths of the people of the book and the fabrication and the lies of their heretics. So Ibn Kathir is embarrassed by the plain statement of the Quran, and he's, he's saying that the Quran doesn't state that, but listen to the words of the Quran. Until when he had reached the setting of the sun, he found it setting in a murky spring, or as some Qurans have it, a hot spring. So Ibn Kathir, not for the first time, is correcting the Quran. He's he's saying something different to what the Quran says. But listen to this hadith from Sunan Ibu Sunan Abu Dawood, Hadith 3991. It says Abu Dar narrated. Once I was with the prophet hiding a donkey on which there was a saddle or a piece of velvet that was at sunset. He said to me, oh, Abu Dar, do you know where this sun sets? I said, Allah and his messenger know better. He said, it sets in a spring of murky water. Then it goes and prostrates before its Lord, the exalted in might, the ever majestic under the throne and when it is time to go out, Allah allows it to go out, thus it rises. But when he wants to make it rise where it sets, he locks it up. The sun will then say, oh, my Lord, I have a long distance to run. Allah will say, rise where you have set. That will take place when no disbelieving soul will get any good by believing in them. Sorry, so this this hadith is from Musnad. Ahmed, um, hadith number 21459. And it clearly says, he said it sets in a spring of murky water. Then you've got Sunan Abu Dawood, hadith 3991, which reads this. Yazid bin Harun, Sufyan bin Hussein, Al-Hakim bin Utayba, Ibrahim bin Yazid Al-Taymer, Yazid al Taimi Abu Dar said, I was sitting behind the apostle of Allah who was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. He asked, do you know where this sets? I replied, Allah and his apostle knows best. He said, it sets in a spring of warm water. So you have two hadiths that both say that the Quran sets in a, uh, a, 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 a puddle of warm water. The Quran says it sets in a puddle of warm water, and Ibn Kathir, who knows better, contradicting the Quran and hadiths. And I don't blame him because it's embarrassing. I don't think I need to explain why this is an error. I think you guys can all recognize it for yourself. Um, but are there any clarification questions, or shall I press on to the next problem? Okay, I'll press on to the next problem. So the next problem is in Surah 2314. It says this, And when we developed the sperm drop into a clinging form, and we developed the clinging form into a morsel-like lump, and we developed the morsel-like lump into bones, and we clothed the bones with flesh, then we produced into it another creation so supremely blessed be Allah the best of creators now there's another textual variation here um, in some Qurans rather than saying bones plural in Ibn Amr, Amr and um, Shubaz uh, Kirat their Quran it says bone in the singular rather than bones in the plural and this is in 2314. Now, why P and Lin? 
I'm pretty sure you know, guys, but do bones grow before flesh? No. No, of course they yes. don't. Bones don't grow before flesh in the womb. Um, it, it, bones and flesh grow at the same time. They grow at the same time. They don't grow in stages. It doesn't, it doesn't, we, you know, we developed the morsel-like lump into bones and then we clothe the bones with flesh is what the Quran says. That's completely inaccurate. And that's not just how I interpret it. Abbas Tanwir al-Mikbas min Tasfir in his, or of Ibn Abbas says this, then fashioned we, then we transformed the drops into a clot for another 40 days. Then fashioned we, then we transformed the clot into a little lump for 40 days. Then fashioned we, the, we transformed the little lump into bones without flesh. It literally says in the Tasfir, without flesh then clothes the bones with flesh joints veins and other things and then produced it another creation and then we placed in it the spirit so blessed be allah the best of creators the best transformer now there's another um tasfir here and unfortunately i forgot to m put in the name of the the person that trans uh, that put it in but I'll, I'll share the link and then you'll be able to discover it yourself um, and these are the words then we transform the drop of semen into a clot of congealed blood then we transform the clot into a limp lump of flesh a piece of flesh about the size of what would be able to chew and then we transform the lump of flesh into bones well that's not what happens guys then we clothe the bones with flesh did you hear that? This is a tasfia, and it says, then we clothe the bones with flesh. So it's not me telling you that the Quran's getting the stages of embryology wrong. The tasfia are telling you that the um, the stages of embryology are wrong. And I apologize for not being able to find the name, but you'll see the link in the chat, and then you'll be able to uh, identify which uh, tasfia I've quoted. Um, I can actually very quickly see if i can just do it myself bear with us one second i'm going to do this super quick and then that way you know who i quoted this is from tell a line bro sorry tell a line i'm so sorry i can't make out what you're saying tell a line bro is that the name yeah, put it on the chat. All right. Uh, bear with us. I, I just want to do it for myself. I uh, I apologize. 23.14. All right. Yes, it's Jalalain. Jalal al Jalalain. That's the one. Yeah. That was the one that quoted. So it, it now let me just let me just read from. I'm going to read from um, a, a a basically medical website that teaches women about embryology. So new mothers about embryology. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read. Uh, right, where does it go? So. In, in month two, so weeks five through eight, these are the things that happen. And you're going to see it clearly demonstrates that flesh and bones grow together because all these things happen between five through eight in the second month of uh, a pregnancy, right? The neural tube, the brain, the spinal cord, and other neural tissues of the central nervous system form the tiny heart tube beats about 110 times a minute by the end of the fifth week. Tiny buds that become arms and legs also develop. Blood cells are taking shape and the circulation will begin. Structures that become the ears, eyes and mouth take form. 
their healthcare. Uh, oh, sorry, that, that that's just a note to the the, the pregnant mother. That's in uh, you know the six week. And then it goes on, bones begin replacing soft cartilage and genitals begin to form. Well, a genital is made of bones. Um, the embryo's head is large in proportion to the rest of its body. Um, and it kind of looks a little like a tadpole at this point. Um, uh, and then in week, uh, uh, towards the end of week eight, all other major organs and body systems are developing. So as you can see, like in just just websites connected to um, embryology are saying that flesh and bones grow together. The Quran gets it wrong. Any clarification clarification questions before I move on to the next one? We're about just slightly less than halfway through, so I probably need to press on. And let, but if anyone needs me to clarify anything, and thanks to the brother who shared the 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 name of the commentator in the in the chat. Okay. Any clarification questions or am I good to go? Good to go. Okay. So in, in Surah 480, we read this. Surah 480, whoever obeys the messenger has surely obeyed Allah. But whoever turns away, then we have not sent you to be a constant preserver over them. Now, I know that in this room there are some ex-Muslims. However, I'm going to be asking you guys a question, but I want to give you time to think about it while I read out my next quote. So the question I'd like you to think about it, for those of you that were ex-Muslims, what is shirk? That's the question I'm going to be asking you in a second. So please do be thinking about what you were taught about what shirk is. And then we're going to talk about it. So in the Tasfiya, it says this. Abbas, um, Tanwir al Mikbas min Tasfiya ibn Abbas, says this. When the verse, we sent no messenger save that he should be obeyed by Allah's leave, was revealed, Abdullah ibn Ubay said, Muhammad commands us to obey him instead of obeying Allah. So Allah revealed the following. Whoso obeyeth the messenger is in that which he commands obeys Allah. Because the messenger never commands anything unless Allah has commanded it. And whoso turneth away from obeying the messenger, we have not sent thee as a warder, a custodian over him. Ibn Kathir writes, obeying the messenger is obeying Allah. Allah states that whosoever obeys his servant and messenger, Muhammad, obeys Allah. And whoever disobeys him, disobeys Allah. Verily, whatever the messenger utters, it is not of his own desire, but a revelation inspired to him. Ibn Abi Hatim recorded that Abu Khraya said that the messenger of Allah said, and it gives a hadith, but we don't need to go into that because it's slightly off point. So those of you that were ex-Muslims, if you're willing to talk on a recorded video, you don't have to if you don't want to. I fully get it. Why not? But is there anyone here that can tell me what tasfia, uh, sorry, what shirk is? What is shirk? Anyone know? You can type it in if you, you don't want to say it. YP, Lynn, can you take a guess at what shirk is? What is shirk? Um, obeying beside God. So, okay, if no one, if no one either knows or, or, or wants to speak, I will... When you say that God is not one, yes, that is definitely an example of shirk. Thank you, brother, in the chat. Any other examples of what shirk is? That's certainly one of them. Give me another example of shirk. In Indonesia, they do they teach Islam in the classroom? Yeah. Yeah. The shirk in Islam is just by shahada. Sorry, say again. Say again, Lynn. Any other examples of shirk, guys? Lynn saying that uh, taking sahada is shirk. What, sorry? 
saying sahaja ikhsirik saying shahada yep now, now now we're looking at from the muslim perspective so muslims wouldn't say that shahada is shirk <laughs> they wouldn't say that unless they're a quran only muslim so i'm i'm, I'm asking you what do muslims say shirk is obeying beside god obeying others worshiping beside god worshiping the statue worshiping someone other than um Worshipping someone other than Allah, that, that would be... Yeah. Okay. The, so Trinity. the Trinity is yeah, shirk. Trinity would be considered shirk, but that's because they don't understand what the Trinity is. So let me read from, um, let me read from Islam QA, which is a Salafist Islamic website. And this is what they, this is their examples of major shirk. This means ascribing to someone other than Allah something that belongs only to Allah such as lordship, divinity, and the divine names and attributes. This kind of shirk may sometimes be outward, such as the shirk of those who worship idols and graves, or the dead or absent, or it may sometimes be hidden, such as those who put their trust in other gods beside Allah, or the shirk and kufra of the hypocrites. For even though they, the hypocrites, shirk puts them beyond the pale of Islam and means that they will abide forever in hell, it is a hidden shirk because they make an outward display of Islam and conceal their kufra and shirk. So they are inwardly mushriki, mushriks, but not outwardly. Okay. Um, let me give you some examples of major shirk according to this website. So these are all from an Islamic source. These are Islamic scholars' definitions. Shirk may sometimes take the form of beliefs, such as belief that there is someone else who creates, gives life and death, reigns or controls the affairs of the universe, along with Allah, or the belief that there is someone else who must be obeyed absolutely besides Allah, so they follow him in regarding as permissible or forbidden whatever he wants, even if he goes against the religion of the messengers, or they may associate with uh, associate others with Allah in love and veneration, by loving a created being as they love Allah, this is the kind of shirk that Allah does not forgive, and it is the shirk of which Allah says, um, and of mankind or some of who take for worship other than besides Allah as rivals, they love them as they love Allah. Now, I, I am constantly told by Muslims that the way you honor, the way you honor, um, the way you honor the prophets is you obey them, is that you do what they say. The thing is that the Quran is saying that if you obey Muhammad, you're obeying Allah. So in other words, Muhammad is sharing in Allah's authority. He's literally sharing in Allah's authority. Allah has authority. Muhammad is sharing in that authority because he is to be obeyed like Allah is to be obeyed. Do you see why that is shirk? Because there is sharing of authority going on. Does that make sense? And this is a problem within Islamic theology. The Quran is saying, whoever obeys the messenger has surely obeyed Allah. And I haven't misinterpreted that because the Tasfiyas themselves say that, as I read earlier, I'm not going to read them again. Um, so you've got a sharing of authority. Allah's authority is being shared. Allah's rule is being shared with Muhammad. Muhammad is speaking as God on earth. And Muslims are obeying him because he is speaking as God on earth. He's literally the mouthpiece of God. He is sharing in the attribute of reign and rulership. He is speaking with God's authority. And that is shirk. He's sharing. He is partnering with Allah. That is shirk. That is in the Quran. The Quran has a theological contradiction. Any clarification questions before I move on? I'd like to press on if possible. Can I ask? Yeah, go on. Just clarification okay. question. Uh, clarification question. It means that uh, Muslim uh, think that uh, Muhammad is the representative of God in the earth, just like that. Yeah, it's a, they, shirik. It's a major saying, shirik. They're saying that, but, but it's not just that he's Allah's representative. Allah has authority 
and Allah has delegated his authority to Muhammad, which means that Muhammad has Allah's authority. That means Muhammad is sharing in Allah's authority, and that's partnership, that's shirk. That's not supposed to happen. The very definition of shirk is partnership. It's sharing. It is that Allah is, you know, and Allah is not meant to have any partners. How many times have you heard that as a Muslim? But Allah is delegating his authority to Muhammad and Muhammad is sharing in the authority of Allah so that to obey Muhammad is to obey Allah. Muhammad is literally at God's authority on earth. And that's shirk. Now, the, the Muslims might try to flip it on us and say, hey, but you've got the same problem in the Bible. Muhammad, uh, you know, Moses goes to Pharaoh and God says in Exodus, I will make you God to Pharaoh. So you've got the same problem in the Bible. And we say, yes, but we don't think that partnership is a problem. We don't think that that us sharing in 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 God's activity is a bad thing. Muslims are the ones that say it's bad. Muslims are the ones that say it's a sin, not Christians. So, yes, they are right to say you've got the same thing in the Bible, but we don't think it's a sin. They do. And that's why it's a problem in Islam and not in Christianity. OK, I'm going to press on. Thank you. I'm going to press on to my next argument. How many have we done? How many have we got to go? One, two, three four five six so we're about halfway through guys hope we're all doing well uh so here's a here's another one now in the quran it says in surah twenty four thirty five, allah is the light of the heavens and the earth and the parable of his light is as a niche wherein is a lamp. The lamp is in a glass and the glass is like a glittering planet. Kindled from a blessed tree, an olive tree, neither eastern nor western, its oil would almost illuminate even if no fire were to touch it. Light upon light, Allah guides to his light whomever he wills. Thus Allah sets forth parables for mankind Allah is all knowing of everything. So that's what the Quran uh, has said that the, the, the parable of Allah's light is like. So it's giving a description of Allah's light in 2435. Now interestingly, there are there is a there is some textual variants here in different Qurans. So Ibn Kathir Abu Am Abu Amar Abu Jafar Yaqub Nafi Ibn Amr and Hafs Quran, the Kirat, read kindled in the masculine form, referring to the lamp being kindled from the oil of a blessed tree. But all other Kirats, all other Qurans, read it in the feminine form, referring to the glass being kindled so there is a very minor textual variant that changes the meaning slightly of which quran you're reading on 2435 but surah 4211 says this the originator of the heavens and the earth he has made for you spouses from among yourselves and of the animals mates by means of which he multiplies you the like of him has nothing like him and he is the all hearing, the all seeing. So the Quran is saying in this passage, in these words, the like of him has nothing like him, is that there is there is nothing that you can think or imagine that is like Allah. Now think about that for a second. If there is nothing that you can think or imagine that is like Allah, we then then these words that we've got in Surah 2435, which is the parable of Allah's light, well, that don't make no sense. And, and this is not me saying this. This is Imam Dulnun al-Misri and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal that say that whatever you imagine in your mind, Allah is different from it. So let's do this exercise, YP. Can you imagine light?
YP or anyone? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, whatever you imagine, Allah is not like that light. Can you imagine a niche? I don't know. Now, there may be a language thing here because niche is quite a, a vague word. Do you know what I mean by niche? Like a little a little gap in something is called a niche. Yeah, can you imagine a niche? Well, if you can imagine a niche, Allah is not like that niche. If you can imagine a lamp, Allah is not like that lamp. If you can imagine glass, Allah is not like that glass. If you can imagine uh, a, a glittering planet or a tree uh, or an olive tree, nothing that you can think or imagine in your mind, Allah is like that, which means that these words don't mean anything. Now, to anyone, can anyone tell me the difference between a word and a sound? What's the difference between our words and the sounds that babies make? We cannot understand babies talking. Exactly. The difference between words and sounds is that words communicate meaning. Sounds do not. If a baby goes blah, 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 that's just sounds. It's gobbledygook. It doesn't mean anything. It communicates nothing. Words like we are having in this seminar communicate meaning. You understand when I say light or lamp or glass, you know, these words have a category in your mind. They mean something to you. But if these words don't mean anything that you can think or imagine, then they aren't words. They don't communicate anything, which means that this ayah of the Quran is full of meaningless words because the parable of his light is that it's like a, a, a blah, wherein is a blah. The blah is in a blah. The blah is like a blah, blah. Kindled from a blessed blah and a blah blah, neither eastern nor western, its blah would almost illuminate even if no fire were to touch it. Blah upon blah, Allah guides to his blah whomever he wills. Thus Allah sets forth parables for mankind, for Allah is all-knowing of everything. The parable makes no sense because the words communicate no meaning. Because anything that you can understand, think, or imagine by the words, Allah is not that. So it literally tells you nothing. It is a sound. It is not a word. It's a sound that sounds like a word, which is funny, but it's not a word. Because if you take Quranic interpretation seriously, it doesn't mean a thing. Because like the like of him has nothing like him. And that's just not what I'm saying. It's what Asra Kasht As Asra says in his um, in his Tasfir. He says the creator of the seven heavens and the seven earths is God, and in creation he is one and unique. He gives being to non being. From what was not, he brings forth what is, and he is not similar to any being. Did you get that? He is not similar to any being. His power has no slacking, his strength no shortcoming, and his measure is far from perception. His act has no instrument, his artistry no cause, his doing no contrivance. He created the tremendous throne, made it crown on the head of being's realm. He created the tiny dust moat and concealed it from the eyes in terms of the power. I mean, I've got to um, applaud Asra for his poetry. It's really beautiful the way that he describes Allah in his uniqueness, in his, in his majesty. But the point is that he's saying this, and this is a direct quote, nothing is as his likeness, and he is the hearing, the seeing. God is a Lord similar to whom there is nothing and no one. So in other words, these words don't mean a thing. Nothing. Um, there's, um, there's other tasfir, um that you've got. I'm going to put in the link because I can blatantly see that I forgot to put in the names on a whole bunch of them. So I'm going to put in the link so that you can see where I'm getting all these Tasfia from, and then you'll be able to identify them yourself. So it's coming into the chat now. Here it is, guys.
So if you open that link, you'll be able to see the website from where I'm getting these tasks for you. Okay, there it is. But here's a, another one from um, from that same uh, website. Here's what he says in his task sphere. I, I don't know which person it is. Um, let's see if we can find it. It's this. This verse corrects the deviation of two groups. The group that says there are no attributes and the group that says there is resemblance. Not having attributes is non-being but God is being. Resemblance comes from partnership, but God is pure of partners and partnership, which is why obeying Muhammad like you obey is obeying Allah is partnership and white shirk. Um, those who allow resemblance are outside the precinct of the submission and those who negate attributes are heretics. So that's one of these task spheres. I'll see if I can find out who that was. Um, if anyone can race me to it, it's 2335. No, it isn't. It's not 2335 that they're giving commentary on. It's the other passage. It's 4211. So let's just pull up 4211. Do, do, do. Okay, I think I've pulled it out as a, a section. Forty-two eleven, the origination of the earth. Knowledge. Okay. All right. So there's there's some of these task figures are quite large, and I've clearly pulled out a section of it. But you have the the link there. Let's just. Press on. Um, here's another tasfia. Uh, God says nothing is as his likeness. He does not say nothing is there, for attributes are there. No attributes, however, are like his attributes. He is hearing, but none is hearing like him. He is seeing, but none is seeing like him. This is just like what he says in another place. Is he who creates like him? Who does not create god has attributes worthy of him and the creatures are far from that created things have attributes worthy of them and the creator is pure of that if these understandings of the oneness of allah are true then the quranic description doesn't mean anything because you cannot understand anything by these words allah is the light of the heavens and the earth the parable of his light is the niche it is as a niche wherein is a lamp and the lamp is in a glass. The glass is like a glittering planet kindled from a blessed tree. It doesn't mean anything. So the criticism is if Allah is completely unique and nothing that we can think or imagine is like unto him, then the um, these words don't mean anything and therefore the Quran has meaningless words. Does that make sense, guys? Do you follow that? Yes, yes, very makes sense. Great stuff. Thank you very much. I always appreciate it when people respond. It makes me think that I'm not losing you all. Uh, okay, so here's another uh, error in the Quran. Okay. In Surah 34, verse 11, it says this. Commanding him, make full coats of mail and calculate precisely the links that work all of you righteousness. Indeed, I of what you do am seeing. Now, the thing is, it says in this, it says here that make full coats of mail. Now, mail armor, mail is the idea that mail is 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 what people in the seventh century called um chain mail armor. Do you guys know what chain mail armor is? Yes, they use for armor in the body, right? Yeah, Just it's like what the, knights used to wear. It's that, yeah, it's like that vest that you see in Robin Hood movies, where the the knights wear these these metal chain vests that are made up of tiny, tiny steel um, iron rings. These these and uh, these are called in the seventh century. They just called them mail. 
That's what they were, the name was. We call them chain mail because the word mail to us means something you stick in a letterbox or a card that you send to your mother. Chain mail makes the distinction. But in the seventh century, they just called it mail armor, just mail. And, and it was a reference to armor. Now, Abbas Tanwir al Mikbis min Tasfir ibn Abbas says this saying, Make thou long coats of mail and measure the links thereof, the measure of a nail, search that it is neither bigger nor smaller than it, and do ye write sincerely to him. So he calls it mail, coats of mail armor. Jalal al Jalalain states, and we said, fashion from it long coats of mail, complete suits of armor, which the person wearing it drags behind him along the ground and measures well the links. That is the weaving of the coats. The maker of these is called Sarad. In other words, make them so that the rings thereof are arranged properly and act, O family of David, together with him righteously Indeed, I am a seer for what you do and require you for it accordingly. Ibn Kathir says, saying, make you perfect coats of mail, as in the armor mail, which means chain mail. So Ibn Kathir literally calls it chain mail. Said he was the first person ever to make chain mail. So he said it twice. Before that, they used to wear plated armor right the problem with that guys is that history tells us that chain mail didn't start at the time of david this is what we call a historical anachronism do you know what a historical anachronism is guys does anyone know historical fallacy probably yeah so if i said something like henry the eighth sent a text message to his wife that would be a historical anachronism. Or if I said, um, you know, Henry VIII, um, uh, Henry VIII sent a postcard to the King of France, that would be a historical anachronism. It's impossible because I'm, I'm, I'm putting something into the historical context that is too, um, it, it, it doesn't fit it. The, 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 te the technology I'm putting into it is 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 too late for the time that I've put it in. Okay. Now the thing is chain mail, right? Which as I've already said is called mail to those that know. It's not called chain mail, it's called mail. It's a type of armor consisting of small metal rings linked together in a pattern to form a mesh. And it is generally in common military use between the third century BC and the 16th century AD and longer in Asia and North Africa. A coat of this armour is often referred to as a hauberk and sometimes a birni. Um, the earliest example of surviving mail was found in the Carpathian Basin at a burial in Horny Jatov, Slovakia, dated to the 3rd century BC. When did David live? Anyone know? 15 BC? It's about 1,000 BC. 1,000 BC. 1,000 BC. 1,000 BC. 15 BC. Yeah. But well, we know, don't know exactly when David lived, yeah, but we know it was very, very late. It certainly wasn't in the 3rd century. And that... Um, it's it, Most historians think that the invention of chain mail is, is to be credited to the Celts um, or the Etruscans. Now, the Etruscans were a European people. Um... And it, it can't be dated really early in the fourth century. Now think about this. It's called the, we, we call it the inverted pyramid of technology. Think about the telephone. When Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, right? We know the point and the person that invented the telephone. And you can trace out the spread and the use of the telephone from that point, And it goes up like a cone in time and space. So it gets wider in time and space from the time of Alexander Graham Bell because it's a technology that worked. If 
If King David had invented chainmail, considering that it was a superior form of armour, we would have expected to see others using chainmail before the 4th century BC because it was a better form of armour. And so the cone, as in its expansion in time and space across the world and going forward in time, should have expanded from, you know, the, the, the 1000 BC. And we should have seen examples of it all over the Middle East. But our earliest examples are not in the Middle East. And all our earliest examples point that the cone of its development, the cone of its development in time and space, goes back to the Celts and can't really go past the 4th century. Even if we were generous and added a 200 years extra, it would take us to the 6th century. And that still is not the time of David. But the Quran is saying chainmail existed at the time of David. That is an error. As as fat error as you want, it's an error in the Quran. And you can just look up the history of chainmail um, to recognize that. Okay, guys, I am going to press on. Um, now, what time? Yeah, okay. Okay, so actually, guys, I have one, two, three, four. I've got four more. Right. But I want to give time for questions and discussion. So I'm going to give you a choice now. And I do need everybody to vote in the chat, please. If you would like me to continue to give examples, put number one. If you would like to for me to um, allow for times of discussion and conversation, put number two, please, into the chat. So I know how you would like me to proceed with the rest of the time. It's really important everybody votes. So far, I've only got three votes. Is it a case that maybe some people didn't understand what I was saying? Maybe. Could you translate so that everybody votes, please? That is your fall asleep. <laughs> what time is it in Indonesia? Uh, almost eleven. Yeah. Eleven in eleven in the evening. Yep. Okay. Um, if you could just translate and ask people to vote, I'll give you time to think. Maybe this is a good opportunity for people just to get up, stretch their legs, go to the toilet uh, and try and refresh themselves. OK, so Lynn is driving, um, so she can't vote. Uh, let's, let's go on. You go um, on with examples. Yeah. OK. Go on. Well, right. I'm, I'm just going to take a short a short rest break. I'll be back in about a minute. And then we'll press on. I'll be back in about a minute, guys. Okay.
Okay, guys, so we're going to press on based upon the minority vote. <laughs> um, okay, so. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry, I'm driving right now. Oh, it's okay, Lynn. Don't, don't, don't worry, Lynn. It's fine. So here's, here's another error in the Quran. So in Surah 33, Ayah 4, it says this. Never did Allah make two hearts inside any man's body, nor did he ever make your spouses whom you reject and compare to your mothers back, backs into your actual mothers, nor did he make your adopted sons your actual sons. That is your saying coming out of your mouths and Allah speaks the truth and he guides to the way. The important part of this verse is the words, never did Allah make two hearts inside any man's body. The thing is, guys, in the ancient world, I know this was gonna, this is going to seem very strange to us, okay? But in the ancient world, people used to think that you thought through your heart. I mean, to us, that's obviously baffling. We know better. But if you think about it, it kind of makes sense before biology, before you studied biology. You know, if something shocked you, your heart would jump. If you fell in love, your heart would race. If you were afraid, your heart would race. If you were shocked, your heart, you know, you'd, you'd skip a beat. You know, people understood, people had more, people who were ignorant of biology. And when I say ignorant, I mean really ignorant of biology. People who were ignorant of biology used to think that your heart was where you thought okay now that's not just me making that up that is that's just something that we know from looking at ancient literature um i'll give you uh, an example bear with us bear with me so if we look at um That one, I think it is. Nope, not that one. Maybe it's the other one. Do, do, do. Hmm. It seems like one of my links is not working. That's unfortunate. Okay. That's a bit frustrating. Bear with us. See if I can get it up that way. Sorry, I'm just trying to get a link up that doesn't seem to be working. Come on. There we go. Yep, worked. So this is quoting from the Journal of American College of Cardiology. And it says this. And I'm just going to read the conclusions because obviously we don't have time for me to read the whole thing. Since humans first recorded their thoughts, they believed that the heart was the most important organ in the body. Ancient humans knew the beating in the chest signifies life, beating harder and faster with fear and upon death beating no more. Societies elevated the heart to the position held today by the brain. It was the body ruler and its source of power. For thousands of years, it was believed that only through the heart could one connect with God. So that's just reading from the conclusion of this, um, this, this commentary. And it clearly states that people in the ancient world who were ignorant of biology thought through the heart. OK, now that it's important you bear that in mind because of in Surah 33, Vore, it says, never did Allah make two hearts inside any man's body. And in Ibn Kathir, I'm commentating on this verse, it reads this, before Allah discusses ideas and theoretical matters, he gives a tangible examples. One man cannot have two hearts in his body. So in other words, Ibn Kathir understands that Allah is meaning something literal when he says that a man does not have two hearts in one body because he's giving 
He's giving a tangible example, according to Ibn Kathir. In the Tasfir of Wahadi, Azbab, Al-Nuzul Al-Wahidi, it states this, Allah hath not assigned unto any man two hearts within his body. That's the Quran. And then he goes on and commentates. This verse was revealed about Jamil ibn Ma'amar. I'm killing the Arabic. Ma'amar al-Fikhri, who was a sensible man who memorized whatever he heard. The Quraysh said he could not have memorized all these things unless he had two hearts. Labib used to say, I have two hearts and my perceptions by means of either one of them is better than the perceptions of Muhammad. So it was an ancient belief that a person could have two hearts. And if you were smarter, then in, in, in Arabian paganism, they thought you had two hearts. In the Tasfir of Jalal al-Jalalain, it says, God has not placed two hearts inside any man. This was revealed in order to refute those disbelievers who said that they each had two hearts with which they could reason better than Muhammad's single mind. Remember, they're making that correlation between heart and mind. Abbas Tanwir al-Mikbas bin Tasfir ibn Abbas states this. Allah hath not assigned unto any man two hearts within his body. That's the Quran. And his commentary is this. This was revealed about Abu Mamar's Jamil ibn Asad, who was called the one with two hearts because of his measured speech. So in other words, the Quran is speaking to an ancient belief that human beings had two hearts. We see that further in the hadiths. Uh, this is from Jami al-Timirdi 3199, and it states this. Kabus bin Abi Zaban, Zabyan narrated to us that his father narrated to him. He said, we said to Ibn Abbas, what is the meaning of the saying of Allah, the mighty and the sublime? Allah has not made for any man two hearts inside his body. He said, the prophet of Allah stood one day for Salat when he was unsure regarding how much he had prayed. The hypocrites who prayed with him said, don't you see that he has two hearts, a heart with you and another with them? So Allah revealed, Allah has not made for any man two hearts inside his one body. So the Quran is correcting what uh, an ancient pagan belief, thinking that a man has two hearts. And it's saying that Allah has not placed two hearts in one body. Hopefully that is as clear as mud, because I have killed that point, right? You get what I'm saying. Now let me read to you from the National Library of Medicine, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, um, PubMed, uh, a study of cardiovascular systems in co-joined twins, an analysis of 14 Korean cases. Abstract. Listen to what it says carefully. A new classification of cardiovascular system in co-joined twins is introduced. A special effort has been made to analyze the degree of fusion and symmetry of hearts and great vessels based on 14 pairs of co-joined twins. The degree of cardiovascular union of the twins is classified into five types. Cases with no vascular union in cardiac aor aortic and inferior vena cavil levels were grouped into type 1, four cases of those. Cases with separate hearts and union between aortas or inferior venae cavae were grouped into type 2. Three cases. Cardiac fusion at the atrial level was grouped into type 3 with three cases. All of the three cases showed fusion between the right atria, subtype ilia, and the theoretical fusion between the left atria or between the left and right atria is put into subtype 3b. The type 4 represents the fusion of both the atria and the ventricles regardless of the number of the chambers, three cases, 
and type 5 represents a single heart in one of the twins on one case. So in other words, we have examples of one body, because that's what a co-joined twin is. We have examples of one body having two hearts. And the Quran says that Allah has never done that. The Quran is just wrong. The Quran says, never did Allah make two hearts inside any man's body. But we have examples of co-joined twins that have two hearts inside one body. The Quran is wrong. Okay, I'm going to press on because I know we need to finish. Cosmological errors. In the Quran, Surah 36, verses 38 to 40, it says this, It is not for the sun to catch up with the moon, nor does the night outrun the day. Each is traveling in an orbit of their own. That's what the Quran says. Um, Abbas Tanweer in his um, Tasfiya says, It is not for the sun to overtake the moon. It is not proper for the sun to rise where the moon appears, such that it takes away its light. Nor doth the night outstrip the day. Nor does the night come at the time of the day, such as it eclipses its brightness. Now, I'm pretty sure all of you can quickly imagine where I'm going with this. They, the sun, the moon, and the planets float each in an orbit, revolve and turn round an orbit. Jalal al-Jalalain puts it this way. It does not behoove. It is better. Neither facilitated, nor is it right for the sun to catch up with the moon and so appear together with it at night, nor may the night out over outrun the day, and thus it, the night, never arrives before the latter, latter ends. And each, each um, have been constructed. Oh, sorry, it's talking about Arabic constructs. Each is in an orbit, swimming, moving. And these celestial bodies are being treated as though they were rational beings. Ibn Kathir puts it this way. On its, fi on its fixed course for a term appointed... The first view is that it refers to its fixed course of locations, which is beneath the throne beyond the earth in that direction. Whatever it, wherever it goes, it is beneath the throne, it and all of creation. This is talking about the sun because the throne is the roof of creation and it is not a sphere at, as many astronomers claim. Did you catch that? It is not a sphere as many astronomers claim, Ibn Kathir believes in a flat earth. Um, rather, it is a dome supported by legs or pillars carried by the angels, and it is above the universe, above the heads of the people. When the sun it is at its zenith at noon, it is in its closest position to the throne, and when it runs its fourth orbit at the opposite point to its zenith at midnight, it is the furthest position from the throne. At that point, it prostrates and asks for permission to rise. That's the verse in the Quran that we've already, the verse in the Hadiths that we already referred to. Uh, fourth orbits, uh, sorry, opposite points to its zenith at midnight. My apologies, I've just gone back. Prostrates and asks for permission to rise, as mentioned in the Hadiths. Al-Bukhari recorded that Abu Dar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I was with the Prophet in the Masjid at sunset. So. Ibn Kathir thinks uh, that the Quran teaches a flat earth and a geocentric orbit. Um, and, and I mean, that's a criticism in itself. You can just look up all the verses of the Quran that talk about a flat earth. They're numerous. Now, I want to show you a video. Let me just get it open for you. This is a video of an actual eclipse. And you're going to see something. Bear with me. It's asking me to do things like accept and reject stuff. There we go. Oh. All right, let me just skip the ad. Okay. Right, I'm going to show you a video of an actual eclipse, and you tell me if the night has caught up with the day. Hmm. Oh, that's annoying. Here we go. Right. 
Let me just figure out how to share screen. There we go. Hope you're all watching, guys. You're not falling asleep. Here's an actual eclipse. You tell me if the Quran is correct in saying that the night doesn't catch up with the day. Can you see that, guys? Does that look like night time? Does that yeah. look like the night catching up with the day? The night has overtaken the day in the solar eclipse. And one of the one of the Tasfiyas literally said that one doesn't eclipse the other. Literally said it in those words. And there you go, guys. You've seen it with your own eyes. Night is overtaking day. That is what a solar eclipse looks like. So the Quran is wrong. Now, how 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 can this be from how can this be from God when it's got so many errors in it? Okay. We have uh two more and then we're done. I hope you're all awake. How are we doing, guys? You okay? Good. Yep. Yep. Good. Still going. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you're finding this useful. And as I say, I'm going to share the recording with YP so you can go back over this if I've gone too quickly. Shirk in the Quran. Uh, uh, here's another example of Shirk in the Quran. In Surah 39, Ayah 43, it says this. Or have they chosen intercessors other than Allah, saying, even though they have no power over anything, nor do they reason? The obvious and Ibn Kathir writes this in his commentary. Allah condemns the idolaters for taking intercessors besides Allah. Did you catch that? Allah condemns the idolaters for taking intercessors besides Allah, namely the idols and the false gods whom they have taken on the basis of their own whims with no evidence or proof. These idols are not able to do anything. They have no minds with which to think and they cannot hear or see they are inanimate and are much worse off than animals then allah says say o muhammad to these people who claim that those who have taken intercessors with allah that intercession is of no avail except for the one with whom allah is pleased and to whom he has granted permission to intercede the whole matter rests with him so ibn kathir and the quran both state that Allah intercedes. Guys, what is an intercessor? Can you tell me? Mm. You know what Helper? an intercessor is? What, sorry? Helper? Yeah, an intercessor is one who speaks on your behalf to someone else. But the Quran has got a slip of the tongue here. It's a slip of the tongue. And I think the reason why it's a slip of the tongue is because really this is Muhammad's words. It's saying it, it calls Allah an intercessor. Or have they chosen intercessors other than Allah? That's the question that the Quran is asking in 39.43. Well, who's Allah interceding to? They've brought Allah down. The Quran brings Allah down to the level of an intercessor. That is insulting to Allah. So there's an example of shirk in the Quran. It has brought Allah down. If 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 shirk is uh, uh, to bring someone above their station, it's logical that to bring Allah beneath his station is also an example of disbelief. And the Quran has stated that Allah is an intercessor. Or have they chosen intercessors other than Allah? So who's Allah interceding to? Who can Allah intercede to? Who needs to, who does Allah answer to that he needs to intercede? You see my point? It's a yeah. very quick, very quick and easy uh, problem. Okay, last one, guys, and then we're all done. Okay, we've gone slightly over our period. If it's, what time is it now in Indonesia? 11 o'clock. So I, I suppose a lot, of people, a lot of you have probably fallen asleep. I appreciate you staying up so late. Okay, and you've we've all got church in the morning. So um, let's look at this last one, which is to show that Allah and Satan both mislead. In Surah 4, Ayah 119 to 120, we read this. This is Satan speaking. 
I will mislead them and I will create in them false desires. I will order them to slit the ears of cattle and to deface the nature created by Allah. Whoever, forsaking Allah, takes Satan for a friend, hath of surety suffered a loss that is manifest. He, Satan, promises them and arouses desires in them, but Satan does not promise them except delusion. And in Surah 1693, we read, and listen to this, and had Allah willed, he would not have made you one community, but he leads astray whom he wills. Did you catch that? He leads astray whom he wills, and he guides whom he wills, and you will most surely be asked about what you used to do. Abbas, in his Tafsir, writes this. Had Allah willed, he could have made you all one nation. He could have made you followers of one religion, the religion of Islam. But he sendeth whom he will astray for his religion. He who is not deserving of it and guideth whom he wills to his religion. He who is deserving of it. Now, I mean, that's problematic in itself. Um, and ye will indeed be asked on the day of judgment of what ye used to do of good and evil in your states of disbelief or faith. It is also said that this means of what you used to do in the terms of honouring or breaking your pledges. Now, the term that we translated as deceived, right? And it, it it's important to recognise that the... It's important to recognize that the many translations are trying to hide this today. There's lots of translations that try to hide this fact. They do not translate it as deceived, but the word that we translate as deceived in our criticism of the Quran is the word makra. Now, I might be mispronouncing that. I'm not an Arabic speaker, so I apologize. Um, but it's the word makra. And in Lane's lexicon, um, which is an Arabic to English lexicon, and it's used as an English dictionary of the Arabic language, the word mim kafra come, translates to to practice deceit or guile or circumvention, to practice evasion or illusion, to plot, to exercise the art or the craft or the cunning, act with policy to practice a stratagem to practice deceit is what it says hans Ware, in his dictionary regard uh, you know which is a scholarly dictionary of the arabic language for english speaking students of the language of arabic states this makra or mak well, i'm mispronouncing the arabic and i'm sure makara or makra means to deceive to delude to cheat to dupe to guile, to double cross. Um, it has concepts like cunning, craftiness, alliness, wiliness, double dealing, deception and trickery, ruse, to artifice, to stratagem, to wile, to trick, to dodge. The um, I mean, there's some Arabic lexicons here, but I, I can't read Arabic, so I'm not going to read them to you. Um, in Google Translate, if you put the word into Google Translate, it comes out as sly, cunning, and deceitful. If you put it into Babylon.com, it comes out as calculating, cunning, astuteness, craftiness, foxiness, craft, slyness, archness, deceit, double dealing, artifice, deception, wiliness. Um, if you put it in Transstar, it comes out as wiliness. Um, ArabEyes.com, it comes out as deception. Um a number of translations today hide this fact. Yosef Ali's translation, Pictol's, Arbery, Shakir, Sawas, Khalifa's, um, Hilali Khan, Malik, a, a number of them. There's huge numbers that, that translate it. And what they do is they change the word. They don't translate as deceit. They translate it as something else. Um. So there's a number of examples where 
the word makra is mistranslated in English translations. And they're doing it because of the theological implications of acknowledging that Allah is doing something that Satan did. Satan did. Okay. Um, and the reason that they're doing it is because they are they're contained by a theological imperative that means that only high or lofty or good or positive or majestic descriptions of Allah are permissible. And since, you know, deceiving is something that is low, debased, bad, negative, they can't translate it. They can't use it that way. But when you use macro for humans, it does refer to conspiracy. It does refer to deception. But because they're talking about Allah, they can't use it in that way. So they resort to things like plan instead because it's less conspiratorial. It's less devious because you can't describe God in a negative connotation. You, you've got to describe him in a positive way. So because of theological reasons, they're distorting the Arabic meaning. They're changing the Arabic meaning because of a theological imperative. And that's what they're doing. But they should translate it as um, something that is deceptive. Okay, so, and we have an example of that, right? We have an example of that that we're all familiar with, which is that in the Quran, it states that Jesus didn't die, but it was made to appear to them. Muslims accept that the reason why Everyone in history believes that Jesus Christ was crucified is because it looked that way. Well, it looked that way because Allah made it look that way. So Allah is the one that deceived. And if Allah is the one that deceived, then Allah is a known liar. Now, does anyone know about anything about Hadith sciences? Let me ask you this question. Jump in if you know the answer. According to Hadith science, can you trust someone in a Hadith chain, in an Isnad chain, if they are a known deceiver? Go on, guys. I think you can take a guess on this. If someone is a known liar, if they are a deceiver, can they be trusted in an Isnad chain? It looks like we've all fallen asleep. Shall we stop? <laughs> logically, we can, logically, we can uh, trust a liar, right? Yeah, you can't trust a liar trust in the snatching. Right. This is this is this is this is this is basic hadith science one hundred and one. If someone is a known liar in a hadith chain, someone who is known to have deceived people, million, you know, lots of people, then then they presence in an isnad chain means that that isnad that that hadith can't be considered sahih it can't be considered reliable the hadith described the quran describes itself literally with the words of hadith it literally the quran literally calls the quran hadith in the arabic calls it itself hadith so the the isnad chain of the quran is allah the angel gabriel Muhammad and then the scribes, whoever they are. Well, the first person in that chain, Allah, is a known liar. He deceives people because he makes people think that Christ was crucified when Christ was not crucified. And that's the only reason, according to Muslims, why people believe that Jesus was crucified. And that means Allah deceived people. So we know he's a liar. He's deceived millions of people for hundreds of years before he corrects it in the Quran in the 7th century, which means that he is the liar in the Isnad chain of the Hadith that is the Quran. And according to Hadith science, you can't trust a known liar, so you can't trust the Quran. Does that argument make sense? Yes. Yeah? Yep. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, now, I just want to bear with us once some... One moment.
Right. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I think we'll stop there, guys. So, any other, and that, and and obviously, this is my argument is based on Surah four one five seven to one five eight, where it literally says, and they're saying, surely we have killed the Messiah, Isa, son of Maryam, the messenger of Allah, and they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them to be so, like Isa. So the Quran is uh, admitting that Allah deceives. Right, guys, um, we're going to stop there. That's all my examples. Um, we've 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 hit our two hour mark. We've gone over our two hour mark, and um, I did give you guys a choice whether you wanted to do questions and discussion or whether you wanted more examples. You went for the more examples, um, and so um, we're going to bring our session to a conclusion there. Um, I'm going to make this recording accessible to YP and YP can share it with all of you guys. I'm also going to upload it onto my YouTube channel so you can catch it there as well. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I hope it benefits you. You know your situation better than I do. Um, so you can decide when it's appropriate to use these arguments. And I hope it's a blessing. Before you go, it would be beneficial to me if you um, just put into the the chat, um, how you found this session, 10 being great, one being rubbish, um, and we'll close in a prayer. So either YP, Lynn, or anyone else, if you would like to pray, please. Um, and again, because we don't believe in Arabization, because Indonesian is just as good as English or Greek or Hebrew, um, let's pray in Indonesian. So if one of you guys would like to close us in a prayer, that'd be wonderful. But Muhammad, you... Okay, mari kita berdoa supaya Tuhan terima kasih karena Engkau telah mengumpulkan kami di sini uh, pada malam ini untuk mempelajari suatu hal yang membelokkan ajaran-ajaran tentang di Kau Tuhan. Kiranya Engkau berkati kami, Engkau berkati um, Brother Bob. You give bless Brother Bob. You give courage, Brother Bob, and thanks. Uh, we are all thanks for the uh, for the knowledge that Brother Bob gives to us. Terima kasih Tuhan. Uh, kami juga berdoa untuk teman-teman kami dimanapun berada. Kiranya Engkau berkati terutama untuk Bu Linsi yang sedang dalam perjalanan. Berkatilah dia Tuhan sampai dengan uh, selamat sampai di rumah. Terima kasih Tuhan. Terpujilah namaMu untuk selama lamanya. Terpujilah Engkau Tuhan. Bapa kami Yesus Kristus dalam nama Tuhan Yesus kami berdoa dan mengucap syukur. In God's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Good night, guys. Christ is risen, and thank you all. And thank um, you. We'll do this again. God bless you all, and God bless all thank your you, efforts brother. in Indonesia. God bless, Thank you. Thank you. Bless.